It's Saturday, nine minutes after the hour. I'm Steve Reinhardt. I'm your host. You're with K Talk AM 630, the voice of Utah, Utah's oldest continually broadcasting radio station. We like to bring you issues of culture, history, politics, religion. We often discuss issues of local importance, current events, but periodically we will do shows about historical topics. We upload the shows on the internet quite frequently, and I find that although we get more callers when we're talking about current events, the shows on historical topics get listened to more on the internet. (laughs) And today is no different. We have an important guest with us today and important historical topic that we'll be discussing. What I want to discuss today is the sinking of the Lusitania, which is the primary factor that brought the U.S. into World War I. The Lusitania was, is almost indistinguishable from the Titanic, yet I find when I talk to people about the Titanic, everyone knows what it is, and when I talk to people about the Lusitania, nobody knows what it is. So I'm going to give you some quick background, and then I'm going to bring our guest on, Greg Bemis, who owns the salvage rights to the wreck of the Lusitania, and who hopes in the future to launch a marine archaeological expedition to penetrate the hull and determine what is in the cargo holds of that ship. Uh, And I want to tell you a little bit about the controversy involving that ship quickly before we we bring our guest on. The Lusitania was sunk by Germany in 1915, only 11 miles off the coast of Ireland. It was an ocean liner that had 1,900 people on it and 1,200 people died. It sunk in between 12 and 19 minutes. And after the wreck, everyone was outraged. I remember as a schoolboy you know, 30 years ago, being taught that the sinking of the Lusitania was the only reason that the U.S. entered World War I. It's not. But as a kid, that's what you're taught. And I asked my teacher, well, why why was this ship sunk? And I was told, well, the reason is, is because the Germans are a bunch of evil, demented, twisted, irrational psychopaths who want to kill people for fun. (laughs) <laughs> that's not actually what the teacher said, but that's what I gathered as a kid. The real answer is much more complicated. The Lusitania may, despite the fact the British government denied this for 70 years after it was sunk, but it may have been carrying weapons. It may have had aluminum powder on it, was used for explosives. It may have had gun cotton on it, used for making munitions. It may have had larger munitions on it. The British government has admitted that it had small arms fire, 303 ammunition, and that it had empty artillery shells. But the British government has gone to great lengths, according to some historians, to try and conceal the contents of the cargo hold holds on the Lusitania. Among other things, they have mined and depth charged the Lusitania wreck. And in 1982, they released a statement admitting that there were munitions of some kind on the Lusitania, and that divers should not enter the wreck. There is a letter from Winston Churchill, who was the first Lord of Admiralty during World War I. He was Prime Minister during World War II. But in this letter, he suggests that the only way that the U.S. might be brought into World War I or embroiled in World War I is if Germany could be provoked into attacking neutral shipping between the United States and Britain in the Atlantic. Now, Greg Bemis, who's, gonna, who's coming on with us, has owned the salvage rights to the Lusitania since 1967. And he knows more than anybody, I think, about the wreck itself. And I want to talk to him briefly about the history of the Lusitania and then also about the controversies that surround her and what may happen in the future, what kinds of expeditions he may, uh, you know, undertakings he may attempt in the future to explore her cargo uh, holds. And Greg, I want to bring you on now. Can you hear me, Greg? I can hear you. I appreciate so much you being with us. And I I apologize for the technical difficulties we had right here at the top of the hour. We just got new equipment in the studio. Yep. I am going to turn your volume up just a little bit. Okay. You can turn it up as much as you want. That's fine. (laughs) There. Our listeners can hear you better now. You're, you're so kind to come with us, and the introduction I just gave to Lusitania is probably very crude by your standards. What what would you tell this, our listeners, many of whom are completely unfamiliar with the ship, about the wreck 
and and then also about yourself and how you became interested in the wreck. Yeah. And, and what you, you 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 covered that in your introduction. Or you want me to talk about it? Well, maybe you can correct anything that you think needs to be corrected in what I said, or or give any uh, other pertinent background you think is important. So you haven't said it yet. Well, what I you and and it's possible that you may not have heard the intro, but I did I did discuss the Lusitania and how. Uh, I didn't hear a thing you said. This is the first time I've heard you. Okay. <laughs> well, I think while you were on hold, the station was not coming through in the background. I but, see. But I did, I did tell our listeners before bringing you on that the Lusitania was sunk in 1915. It was the primary factor that brought the U.S. into World War I. And That's that there correct. are controversies that surround her sinking, especially whether maybe there were munitions in the cargo holds. Yes. And that you own the salvage rights and have for some time. And now, so, I, I, I would put it differently a little bit, Steve. Okay. I, and this relates to one of your questions. Uh, uh, a, a partner, a former partner of mine, bought the deed to the ship. It's just like any other insurance problem. When your automobile is a total, the, you give the deed to the insurance company, and they take title to the property. We bought, we bought the deed from the London Liverpool War Risk Board, which had paid off Cunard. In 1967. What that, results in, what that results in is that I own everything that Cunard owned, but I don't own the private personal property or the cargo. But I have, because of the fact that I own the site, in effect, I do have salvage rights. So I don't think I purchased salvage rights directly. I'm talking like a lawyer now. Only indirectly. Is that okay? Yeah, that, I appreciate that clarification. Tell us, how did you become interested in the ship? And, uh, and, and tell us a little bit about the controversy surrounding the ship. Okay. I, I became interested in the ship because I had founded a venture capital operation. It was a personal venture capital operation in Boston, and I was investing only in ocean-related product lines and, and developments. And the Lusitania came along because of this other partner, uh, and uh, and they called to see if I'd be interested in participating, and I did. And what we were doing then was building the first mobile uh, saturation diving system in the world. There was one saturation diving system at Duke University and one, of course, at the Navy War Labs, but ours was on board a ship. And we were going to use that. It was going to be rated to 600 feet. We were going to use that for salvage on the Lusitania and then move on to other ships around the world that might be more remunerative than the Lusitania. So that was, it was a technology investment, a business investment originally. And that has now evolved a lot because of various problems uh, into more of a research and recovery operation, particularly related to the history and and we're still, as you, you will we'll get into the study, we'll, we're still concerned more with, with the history and the question you mentioned about munitions than we are about actually salvage. Um, you know, there were uh, 1,200 people that died on that ship, and, and quite a few of them are in the ship. Uh, we have found that uh, the human body uh, is rapidly eaten by sea life, and the chances of there being any remains, human remains there, we've never seen any in the in the last 20 years of work, never seen a single bone, a single anything. Um, and so I think that the chances of there being any so-called bodies there uh, is gone. There is, of course, the question of the human spirit, and I don't want to get into religion on this. People look at it differently, but basically we, we tread very lightly. We showed a lot of respect, uh, but... Basically, that's not a problem. Well, t- can you summarize the the history of the attempts to penetrate the hole and and retrieve any objects of monetary or historical significance from from the wreck and the challenges, legal and logistical, that you faced in trying to do that yourself? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> Basically, since I own the ship, I feel I should be able to go and investigate it, recover worthwhile artifacts, and so forth. Unfortunately, UNESCO, and I won't tell you what I think about UNESCO, but they 
decided a few years ago, I think it was 87, that any ship that was 100 years old in situ was an archaeological object. Now, archaeology, as you know, I assume, is basically in the book, definition book, it's the scientific investigation of ancient peoples and cultures. I don't consider the Lusitania to be ancient people and cultures, but they're using that as a reason for demanding that I get a license for whatever I want to do with this ship. And for 20, over 20 years now, they've been fighting with me. And the result is that I've had to go to court three times. The first time in London, when we did make some recoveries, which we turned over to the receiver of REC. And when we did that, we had to wait a year to get them back so we could use them. And when we did, the receiver of REC told me they didn't belong to me, they belonged to the Queen. So I had to take the Queen to court in London, which I did, and I won. So that was step one. Secondly, here in the States, uh, we had some scavengers here in the States that went over there and ripped it off, a few items. And so to stop that and gain jurisdiction over any United States divers, I went to the U.S. courts in Norfolk, Admiralty Court there, and, and again, I won my case, and they told everyone to stay away, that it's my property. The third time was in Ireland, when they stopped letting me do anything. I had to go to court there. They demanded that I go to court in Ireland to prove what I'd already proved in both England and in the United States. I won there, but in that one, they said I still had to get a license from the Heritage Department that had placed a cultural heritage order on the ship in 1995, and that cultural heritage order said nobody could go into the rectangle in which the ship lay without getting a license. That included fishermen, which continually violate that, but they do nothing about that but it also applies to any divers, tech divers, or any other kind of divers. And so we've had to go through the process of applying for licenses. Well, that was a neat idea, except for the fact that then they don't give you a license. They deny it, because I'm not an archaeologist. I do not have a Ph.D. in archaeology. Therefore, I'm not qualified to do something that they aren't qualified to do, because they aren't allowed to dive below 150 feet, and the ship lies at 300 feet. So they can't do anything and don't do anything. All they do is interfere with my efforts to spend my money and other people's money to get artifacts up and to do the research that you spoke of on the munitions question. Now, we have found the munitions. Uh, the munitions we found were, of course, just the, the uh, Remington 303s, which there were some three to 5,000 of on board, three, three to 5 million on board, and uh, the important point now, I'm going to step aside to the law once again, is back in those days uh, of war, as it intensified, if your ship was had contraband, I think is the word you use, which means war materials on board, it was considered a legitimate target. We've recovered the some of the Remington rounds, so we know, and of course the Germans knew everything that was on board the ship because the German dock workers in in New York sent a record of everything they put on every ship going over to the war zone, so then transmitted that to the German embassy, which transmitted it to German headquarters, and then the German headquarters, of course, notified their submarine fleet as to uh, the possibility of a ship coming into the area that they could try to sink and prevent that ammunition, that, that uh, contraband, from reaching the war zone, all very understandable. So I don't feel that the Germans basically did anything that, that would be not expected of them to do in the war, except for the fact that this was a passenger ship. And that gets back to the question then of what in the name of heavens was either England or America doing putting munitions on board a passenger liner. It should, on, a, on a freighter, right. that'd be one thing, but on a passenger liner, it's inexcusable. And and the cruiser rules were in effect, which are yep. 100 years old. But there there's yep. a debate over how seriously they were taken, whether they were recognized as binding authority or law upon the United States and England. 
and, and, and to what extent they justify Germany's sinking of the Lusitania. Can you speak uh, to that? Course, so that is just depends on which side you are. Mm-hmm. And, and what, is, what is your opinion, trying to be as objective as you can be about that question? Uh, uh, Steve, I, I, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I try to stick to areas that, are, that I can understand. Uh, the, the, I really don't know enough about the cruiser laws or all the arguments to, to answer that. Uh, to me, it's quite simple. There was, there was ammunition on board the ship. Uh, why shouldn't they sink it? Now, and beyond the question of ammunition... Do you suspect, given the extensive knowledge base that you have about the Lusitania, that there were larger uh, explosive and bulk munitions? Oh, on... Absolutely. And, and, and... I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that there was a gun cotton on board, significant amount of gun cotton on board. There were shipments that came from DuPont in crates to the to uh, this is on the manifest and, and they said it was uh, butter 90 tons of butter butter and cheese yeah and that that's irrational it was unrefrigerated too uh and not only that but as as mitch peak points out it was headed for the navy war labs so um it it's it's seems to me highly likely and the and you know if you were to try to sink uh 789 foot ship um, you would probably take you many, many hours, days even, to do it. It's a huge process. And this thing sank in 18 minutes from one torpedo. Uh, so my belief is is that the pure mechanics of doing that meant that that second explosion was really massive, really massive, and, and more so than uh, not small ammunition, but, uh, but munitions, and, and- really real munitions. And for, and for our listeners who ha, who have yet to familiarize themselves with the history of the Lusitania, there was a an explosion caused by the torpedo and a second explosion, according right. to the passengers who who survived. The origins of which are are uncertain, but probably caused by these the gun cotton and and munitions you speak of. Would gun cotton <laughs> cause that, or what do you what do you think caused that second explosion? Oh, I mean, if, if the, the 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 torpedo that went in was was massive and make a big hole, but more important. It would be firing off shrapnel in all directions, um, and and uh, in effect, back sh- shrapnel. And I think that would be enough to set off the gun cotton. So you think it was gun cotton and not coal dust or the steam? Oh, it wasn't steam coal engines. dust. Just for the, the coal dust thing was a myth that Ballard made up, just to try to answer something because he couldn't get a good answer. And 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 coal dust has never been a recorded coal dust history of a moving vessel. And the reason for that is because of the water outside the ship cools off the walls so you don't get the uh, the uh, the uh, moisture on the walls. Oh, you do get the moisture on the walls because it's hot inside and cold outside. You get moisture on the walls and that eliminates any dust. So there's no... There's, uh, but cold That's dust what is I've a read myth. as well. It's a myth. What, what kind of relationship do you have with Ballard? Do you, do you know him uh, personally? I know him personally. Uh, I was, and he I was discovered the Titanic wreck for our listeners. Time, and uh, I met with his, he hired uh, uh, an ex-officer, uh, uh, armory officer, whatever, from England, which obviously has a vested position, mm-hmm. to be on his expedition there. And I met that officer the night before he joined the ship, and we talked about it, and he had already decided that it was a coal dust explosion because, of course, from his point of view, Britain's point of view, there were no munitions on board. And and so at the end of the two weeks that Ballard was there, he announced that he discovered that it was a coal dust explosion. And, of course, that's just baloney. And, and, what... and I asked him one time later on as a result of another film he was making, I said, Bob, you know that wasn't a coal dust. Why did you do that? And he said, oh, what difference to make? I see. And and what efforts has can you summarize for us has the British government taken to try and hide the contents of those cargo holds? Have they well, depth charged the, the the wreck of the Lusitania? Yes, they did, and and I believe there was a fam- very famous uh, uh, salver that worked for the Beasley, I think his name was, who worked for Britain, and I believe he made a visit uh, earlier prior to the. Um, depth charging, but in the early 50s, they came out and they were there for a week 
depth charging the, the ship. And I think that the reason they were doing it was trying to make it so damaged that it would be impossible to do an investigation. But that's that's just opinion. I mean, that's no fact. That's just opinion. It's not opinion that they were there because people on shore could hear the death bombs for a week. And there's a lot of talk about it in the local saloons. So um, that's that's. But I, I, I don't know. I. I think the British have obviously tried to cover it up. Churchill, as you know, was was the the guiding light there, and he um, is a saint in in uh, England. And they didn't want anything to do be done to, in effect, detract from his reputation. And I think that's a little bit silly, but that's all right. And and do, I mean, would it be fair to speculate that England shares some sort of comparative fault with Germany and the sinking of the Lusitania. Is that going well, too far? Um, okay. There was a recorded conversation between Churchill and one of his peers uh, 10 to 14 days before this event happened, in, in which Churchill said, you know, we've got to get America in the war, and sinking freighters will never do it. We have to have a huge casualty uh, in order to get this to happen, to get them in. And then lo and behold, two weeks later, um, the Lusitania gets sunk with 1,200 casualties, a lot of Americans and Canadians. And that, of course, was the start of the storm to drive Wilson and the pacifists into getting into World War II. One, so, one. Uh, I, think, I think that, yes, you could say there's some, some credibility. It's also interesting to note that Churchill was admirably, head of the Admiralty then, and he managed to make it possible for him to be out of the country for the, the night before and the day of the sinking, so that he was not there in charge of his department. It was an interesting bit of timing on his part. And, and what does the future hold for, for the wreck? Can the items of monetary value and historical value be retrieved, in your opinion? And, and what are those? I mean, there are paintings, I understand, and film... Precious metals. I, I, yeah, I, I don't think there are metals. There are valuable paintings. There are valuable paintings, which I think probably were in lead tubes. I would expect that they would have been uh, uh, violated by now. I would doubt that they're of any value at all. Um, we've never found them. There was a British diver that claimed she'd seen the wreck, um, seen the paintings, but she didn't. She saw other tubes. The paintings were somewhere else. Um, Do you know where I you might find them in, in the, the wreck? Oh yeah, they'd be in, if they were in the wreck. But actually, actually no, they aren't in the wreck because when when they when the minister of arts, culture, and heritage put the heritage order on the ship, he then investigated to see where the paintings. If send out and find out about the paintings, they found the paintings hanging on walls in museums and private collections, the ones that were referred to. So my guess, and if you studied the manifest, you'd find a clue on it. I've done this. That I don't think they ever made it to the ship. I think, uh, I think uh, Sir Hugh Lane had them taken off the ship or never put them on the ship. I don't think they were there, and they were the only things of value. No value. No one was shipping gold or silver to into a war zone. It was being shipped out of the war zone. So my guess is that those were the only things of real monetary value. And of course, uh, I don't think they're probably any good if they were there. And I don't think they're there. Now, there's a. You know, there's seven hundred thousand dollars worth of copper ingots there. Uh, that would be lovely to salvage, but but I'm not concerned with the salvage for that purpose. I'd like a few of those copper ingots to put in the museum, and I'd like a lot of other things to put in the museum. But I don't think that my interest is not in salvage for monetary value. My interest in salvage will be strictly for the purpose of providing materials for the Lusitania Museum, which is under construction on the old head of Kinsale and will be a significant memorialization for this great, great tragedy. And uh, and let me step aside one more thing. Mm -hmm. Why am I doing all this? Uh, Steve, um, I have a a sort of a a bone to pick with government cover-ups, of which seem to be pandemic these days, but uh, I've been involved with several investigations. The other one was the Estonia wreck, which was sunk on purpose, in my opinion, in which the authorities refused to take a look at the evidence. And and 
this one here is the same thing. If this is a major, major historical event, and they don't want, the authorities won't let us get to the bottom of it when we could. It takes money, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes a lot of skills, but the technologies available today would make it possible to do a lot of good work on this, but they won't get out of the way. The archaeology unit there refuses to allow anything that might be slightly damaging. For instance, um, we went down there a few years ago, three or four years ago, to do a, a dive. We finally got permission. It was a great effort, huge effort, to get permission to cut a small hole so we could send a small ROV, remotely operated vehicle, inside to look. And they said, but after you cut the hole, you've got to put the piece you cut out, you've got to put it back. Now, there's 60 million pounds or more of steel down there, and we were talking about a 20-pound piece of steel from one spot, and this is going to destroy the archaeological uh, significance of this, this site. And uh, that's preposterous. And, and why do they say that? Is it just because they're bureaucrats who don't understand, or are they part of some sort of concerted effort to make things difficult? Have you ever had to work with any archaeologists? Well, I, I share your concerns about archaeologists, and, and we discussed this just a little bit. Yeah, I, 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 I think they're pedantic, and I, I don't think that they're results-oriented. I, I, I think that's that absolutely they, correct. That's, they're both pedantic, they're academics, and they're not in the real world. They're in their little dream world. And if this was truly uh, uh, eight, 10,000 years old, it would be one thing. But we have plans, engineering plans, drawings of all the ship. There's nothing there. We know how everybody lived. Uh, you know, the the uh, printing press was invented back in the 1400s. We've been writing these things down for years. So how the heck do they think they're they're doing anything that is remotely related to uh, investigating ancient peoples and cultures by classifying this as an archaeological site? Now, if this was a Greek ship in the Aegean Islands, that was 2,000 years old, I suppose it, they might might be some excuse for that. But for the Lusitania, it's just nothing but an excuse. It's just a, a power grab. And, and I, do, do they sympathize with the with the British hope that the, that the wreck never is explored? Or, or? You know, there's, there's a huge amount of animosity on the Irish side against the British. has been for years, as you know. And, mm. and I can't believe that the Irish actually officially sympathize with the British. That doesn't mean that the British, with all their trade and banking and everything else, and diplomatic relations, that they can't lean on the authorities. Now, whether they do or not, I don't know. I've accused the, the underwater archaeology unit as being paid by the British, um, and that's just, I just can't resist doing that, but I have no evidence of that, of course. Well, well tell us what the future holds. Are are you you're getting along in years? You're ninety now. Is that right? That's right. Yep. What What do you plan on doing in the future? And can you overcome these bureaucratic obstacles that the Irish government has put in front of you? What? Oh, uh, it's a wonderful question, and I wish I could answer it. All I can tell you is I'm I'm not giving up. I'm working now to try to find a home for the for the uh, ship for the wreck when I depart this earth and and with a group that might be willing to continue my efforts um, to um, find out the answers and to do the research uh, necessary. It's not, it's not impossible to do, but it's a brute strength thing. What you have to do is to go down there and remove, which is perfectly possible, remove some of the side plates, and that gives you the access to get into the, to the lower part of the ship on the starboard side, you realize the tor torpedo hit on the starboard side. Nobody knows where the torpedo came in. There's not a living or dead person that knows where it came in uh, because it's never we've never seen the hole. And so people love to say it came in in the middle of the ship or the back. And there's, But I've done all the arithmetic on it, and the chances are 100%, not 100%, the chances are 90% that it came in up forward of the main mast, right above, just above or a little bit aft of the uh, converted... Uh, uh, munition storage area, which would be, of course, where the where the uh, gunpowder would have been on and the starboard the side, shells, and the other shells were located there. So you just take off the side panels, go in there, and and look around. Now it's a mess, um, and and it, it would. But engineers are very capable of looking at messes 
and trying to figure out what happened. And so I think it could be done, but but you have to have cooperation, which we don't have. And how long do we have till the wreck collapses entirely and just deteriorates beyond beyond uh, cognition? Well, good question. Uh, uh, some would say that's already happened. I don't think that's happened. Uh, we the the um, um, port side, which which is the one that faces at an angle up to the surface, is intact enough so that you could take the plates off of that side. The other thing you can do is you can go in and eliminate other possibilities. For instance, if you go in on the port side, you can go through into the area that's pretty well standing up to still to where the um, uh, coal boilers were. And you can see whether any of the coal boilers had blown up, which is one of the theories. And you could do that. And that would eliminate completely that question. And so, you know, you, one way of getting to the answer is to by eliminating possibilities. And that's a very easy one to do. It's expensive, it's tough, but it's doable. And and but whether we can round up the money and do it or not, I don't know. Who so you plan on leaving you, you mentioned the rights to the Irish American Historical Society or family yes. members. And do you do you have confidence that they'll actually be aggressive and take the initiative in trying to I make don't these have things confidence in anybody? The only person I know that will do this is me, but but I'm obviously not going to be able to. So, but you know, you have to make take take your chances, make your choice, and so forth. Are 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 there newer technologies that would make things easier? Could you send probes or drones, auto, autonomous drones, into the into the wreck site and scan the interior? Could things like uh, that be done? Yeah, we we did that in 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 2015. We had when we were on that expedition. With the National Geographic, we got inside with a small ROV, and we were finding great things. We lost, unfortunately, some of the footage. We supposedly lost the footage. I still am not sure whether the footage was actually um, lost or whether somebody said, hey, let's not let that stuff out. Who, who uh, might have said that? Uh, who do you suspect? The Irish and the British would decide, have decided with, I'll tell you, with, with the, the, our State Department in cooperation therewith, and, and I suppose there's there's no way to, to confirm or to, that 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 that's the case. They they had the footage and it didn't go straight to you apparently. Yeah, exactly. When it came time to review all the footage, we'd seen the footage. We'd seen the footage. We were sitting in the at the bridge of the ship watching this whole period, these hours of, of searching down there with the ROV. And we've seen the footage, and then somehow or other that particular reel, or what are you going to call it, disappeared. And I don't understand how something like that could happen, but it did. And my guess, I don't want to be overly uh, conspiracy-oriented, but my guess is that it was it was footage that they decided it was better to be uh, not get out of the public. I don't know. That's all I could think. There's one other thing. You went, Before I get away from it, the Churchill thing, Steve, I don't know how much time you've spent on the water, but not, the not nothing compared to yourself. Yeah, the the concept of the Lusitania being in the exact spot where a submarine, after two weeks or eight, ten days at sea, and a submarine to be in the exact spot where it would get the perfect shot on a ship moving at 15, 18 knots, uh, the, 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 that, that, you know, they didn't have navigation, uh, celestial navigation in those days, uh, the sophisticated one. They had to shoot stars, uh, moons and stars, suns and whatnot. I just can't believe that they weren't in that location because they knew where to be. Now, the thing that was known... The thing that was known was that the ship had a special orders to come across the country, across the ocean, and go where, where it went. Those special orders would have been transmitted to the Germans, and that's the only way I think that submarine could have been in exactly the right spot. If they'd been 300 yards, 500 yards further away, they wouldn't have been able to get that shot, so something like that. And, and and the captain survived, but wouldn't yeah. testify about some of these things. Now, the, the captain, I, to me, the captain was a hero. 
Uh, he never broke faith. He never disclosed what his personal his personal sailing orders were. And one of my objectives had been at all times when these diving teams, tech diving teams, wonderful guys, go down to look around. One of the things we always try to do is try to find the captain safe because I would assume there was a, he had a safe in his in his office in his in his headquarters his quarters. Uh, I assume that those sp- private sailing orders would be in that safe, and if we could get that back, we'd be able to, with good conservation practice, we'd be able to take a look at those orders. Would they? Would they? St- they, they haven't deteriorated beyond beyond the ability to analyze them. No, I don't think so. There, you know, it's very stable down there. There's no, it's it, in that sense, it's in a safe. They'd be very still, and they might be deteriorated. But we've got some amazing abilities now to restore that kind of thing, and um, and if 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 those orders said that he was supposed to be at 12 miles or 14 miles offshore, um, that would be a huge finding because they, in the hearings they had, they said, well, he was out of line. He was supposed to be at 60 miles offshore zigzagging when in fact he was going straight 14 miles offshore and he'd just come out of fog. So he's going a little bit slower than normal. And, um, I think, I think he wouldn't have been there if, if it had, his orders had told him to be offshore. So it'd be wonderful to find those orders. And, and a, a larger point might be, I mean, was the captain directed into the kill zone, and and were the Germans made a given advance notice of of that? Well, I think that's right. Correct. And, and through some German, sort of double agent or something. Yeah, I think. That, well, I don't didn't take a double. Well, double agent took all it took was. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think that I think the Germans have been instructed as to what his his sailing orders were. That would be my guess. Well, for me, and I'm I'm younger than yourself, and I I look at individuals like yourself who have this knowledge base, and I and I think there there's nobody in the future who is going to take the time to try to under, understand this all or do anything about it. I wish there was something that we all could do to make this expedition happen for you. Well, the, the first thing that has to be done, realistically, the first thing that has to be done is we have to get the Irish government to get off my back or anyone else's back that's trying to do this. And, and how can that be done? I, obviously, I don't know, because if I had knew, I would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> can, can they be pressured legally? Again, uh, you've, you've been successful in that before. You know, uh, I've been very successful, but you're a lawyer. You know how much you charge. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, if I could go to court again... Uh, they've got a series of laws over there which they're hiding under and claim that they have the right to do this, and they're leaning on UNESCO and, and so forth. Uh, and they've declared it part of their cultural heritage, which I think is a little bit of extreme, but I'm not going to argue that basis. But they can just make it difficult. And, and so it needs to be someone at the top. Unfortunately, the president of Ireland at the moment who is just a figurehead, but nevertheless, he's the president. And he was the minister of arts, culture, and heritage and was the one who put the heritage order on it without saying a word to me or contacting me or asking any questions or anything. I can't imagine him being much help because it would be a a red face for him. So um, we either have to wait for a, a a new president or or England and State Department uh, have to get together and say, hey, it's time to take the, the cover off of this thing and do a proper investigation. One of the things I compare it to, Steve, is we've had, I won't go through them all, we've had five major uh, airplane crashes, um, you know, TWA, uh, um, Pan Am, uh, so forth, um, mm-hmm. where we've had two or 300 people killed and we've spent five to ten to fifteen million dollars investigating it there's been no government money spent investigating the lusitania and that to me says a lot that they don't want the truth un- uncovered it, exactly we, we've talked a little bit about the 
the motivations that the British government would have to try and hide what's down there. But if it's true that there was gun cotton and aluminum powder and, and munitions in the cargo holds of Lusitania, what does that say about the American government? Did were they oh, unwitting I, accomplices? To I think to, they were. I think they were. Yeah, I'm sure. I don't think. I don't think there was any question that they were accomplices. But I don't think. I think in their case, they were duped to some degree. That's the way it looks to me too. But but, uh, but Wilson was Wilson was a pacifist, and he didn't want to do anything to get us in the war. And he was trying to keep us out. And then he had other people. You know, he there were other people from the Eastern Seaboard that were very much world oriented, much more Europe oriented, and wanted to save Europe. And they were having a battle as to whether or not we should go to war. And and Wilson prevailed up until the time the Lusitania sank, and that began to increase the pressure considerably on him to participate. But uh, I'm sure prior to that time, he was shipping munitions on every ship he could. To, England was bringing as much as they could over. They needed help. But and, but now that the war's over, the U.S. still has no motivation to investigate whether they were duped. That's it, right. You know, it's, it let let sleeping dogs lie. I see. Well, we're run, we're running a little short on time. I know our listeners are going to be interested in hearing uh, or, or learning more about the Lusitania. What what sources can they turn to that are authoritative, in your opinion, to to learn the truth about the Lusitania, and, and which sources ought they avoid? In your okay, opinion. the the best book by far on the ship and the accident is the one you know, the Lusitania story by Pete Jones mm-hmm. and Walt Johnson. That is, those guys did a fabulous job of research. They're not professionals, but they did a great job of research with what was remaining to be found to do research on. The other books tend to be uh, much more interested in the people than they were in the the ship and what caused the accident and all that they tend to they I, I, I one of them i refer to is the soapbox uh, the soap opera story about the lusitania and then the one that just came out um um uh, what was it um uh, what's the what's the one that was written this year past year Oh, Eric Larson's book. Okay. Uh, that one is a is is all about people, and he get to look, he devotes about one and a half pages to the sinking, and and he's mostly wrong. And I think that writing books that are fiction uh, don't help us get to the truth. So um, now I don't mean when I say writing fiction, Larson's book wasn't fiction. He just didn't write about the sinking. He wrote about the people and all the politics and who was a friend of whom and so forth. Um, so uh, I, I don't have any other good book on the subject other than the Lusitania story. I think that's, from a purely research point of view, that's the best book there that's is. That's the best one. And, and the older books, some of the ones that came out in the 50s and 60s, came out before a lot of the evidence even existed. So I would assume that they ought to be avoided as well. The British government hadn't, hadn't even acknowledged at that time that there were munitions on the ship. That's right. And they really didn't acknowledge it until we started bringing it up. Mm-hmm. In my first trial in Ireland, my first trial in Ireland, I had a, a, a letter from the British, one of the British ministries admonishing a, a dive group that there weren't any munitions on board, but if they went down and found any, be careful because they'd be still alive. Uh, <laughs> how do you reconcile those? those and statements? I read that into the record because the judge <laughs> loved it, and and of course now we can't find it because the Irish don't keep records. <laughs> the, in one of the videos that you made of the of the hull, the, a depth charge can can be seen there clearly. Are, would those depth charges still pose a danger? For technical divers, uh, um, that's a very good question. We we <clears throat> in one of our early recoveries, we brought one of those de- depth charges up and um, put it on a little thing to float it, dropped it overboard, and then and hit it with a rifle, sh- r- and it made a huge explosion. So the answer is the explosive still works. The question is the detonator, and mm-hmm. and I'm not a munitions guy, so. I don't know whether or not the detonators on those on those uh, old death bombs 
are safe to play around with or not. I just have no idea. I see. And so, and so any diver who assisted you in some sort of future expedition would, would face these, these sorts of uncertainties and, and Well, and yeah, when we on, the, on Ballard's trip, which was the one in, in 93, um, he inadvertently allowed uh, the mini-sub that we were using to come to rest on the bottom at one point. That was the time I wasn't in it, thank goodness. But he, and when it got up to leave... The pilot of the sub said to Ballard on the on the tournament, "Was that a death bomb I was sitting on?" And Ballard said, "Yeah, probably." And he said, "Thanks a lot." Um, so uh, you were able to put a submarine down and sit on it, and it didn't go off. But I don't know anything about detonators, and and I think probably if you leave them alone, you're not going to have a problem. But if you want to mess with them, who knows? I see. Well, in just the two minutes that we have left, can you give us some parting thoughts? And maybe let me ask you, what, what position do you think that Churchill ought to, uh, or how he ought he be viewed by history? Is he considered too much of a heroic figure? No, I think I think Churchill was a marvelous man. Of course, his, his elocution was beautiful. The things he said were sensational. He was a huge leader. Uh, he did a wonderful job, and if he hadn't done the job he'd done, uh, the, the whole Western world might be speaking German today. So, uh, you know, I have, I have no criticism with that. It's the old argument, does the end justify the means? Does sinking the Lusitania and getting us into the war save the rest of Western Europe? Uh, and, of course, you never have an answer to that. All you can do is hypothesize. But I think Churchill was a great man. I, I know there are people that disagree with that, but I think he was a great man. But I don't I don't think it detracts from him if he did arrange from the for the singing of the Lusitania, I think you could have done it more subtly and there are better ways of doing it, but um, it did get us into the war. It did help save Western Europe. And, okay, those are great thoughts. Give us 30 more seconds of, of final thoughts on on the wreck, anything that you think is important, and then we'll, we'll wrap the interview up, and I'll make sure that you get a copy of this after I let you go here in a second. Okay, uh, I don't, I, I've said everything that's important, uh, Steve. I want to see... I want to see this major thing in history properly uh, understood and researched. I don't think you lose. I don't think you lose anything by seeking the truth. Uh, the truth sometimes is painful, but it, I don't think in the long run you lose anything by getting the truth. And I think having the truth in the Lusitania is a positive, not a negative. I think it's much healthier to get those answers and find out. Secondly. The memorialization, I really, the the local Irish people there that I've worked with are 100% behind what we're doing. They, not me, are the ones who have organized the building of the museum. They've done a superb job of a memorial garden, and a, uh, it's just a lovely spot there. It's dramatic, and I'd like to see that enhanced in any way possible, and that means recovering more things, which means getting the underwater archaeology unit to shut up and get out of the way. I really appreciate you coming on to, today. I wish we had more time. This is a subject you could talk about for hours or days, and I hope that what our listeners have heard today inspires them to get online and, and go to the library and learn more. Greg, I'll, yep. I'll email this to you after we get off the air, and then I'll, I'll get a hold of you here uh, a little later. I, I appreciate you so much taking the time to come on this Saturday afternoon. Oh, you're wonderful to let me do it. I really enjoy it, and obviously, and... <laughs> And I appreciate all your help, really. Well, well, thank you, Greg. And uh, thank you for coming on. I'll let you go. That was Greg Bemis, who owns the rights to the Lusitania wreck. The Lusitania was similar in many regards to the Titanic and also to the Queen Mary, which is sitting in Long Beach, California. Many of you have seen that there and even stayed on it. It's been converted into a hotel. As a matter of fact, my wife and I may be staying on it next weekend when we're out there in California. Time is short. We're coming towards the news at the top of the hour. These historical questions I, I consider to be extremely important, and I hope that our listeners think not just about current events going on in the world, but about how our world currently has been shaped by events of the past. Greg mentioned on the, on the during this interview that he, he can't overemphasize the importance of clarifying what happened to the Lusitania 
to history. And I would say, I would add to that, that I consider clarifying, if you want to use that word, how the Lusitania was sunk or to what extent maybe Germany was induced into sinking her to be as important to history as the exploration of King Tut's tomb. I would say, in fact, and, and this is the reason I invited Greg on the show, that it is the most important historical mystery or, or mystery in world uh, military history uh, that there is. And so I, whatever can be done to help Greg, he's really the only person in the world who has a chance of resolving this all right now. Uh, I, I would like to see him, him receive the assistance that he needs. We are going to wrap it up. We're coming to the top of the hour. Thank you for being here with K-Talk, AM 630, the voice of Utah, Utah's oldest continually broadcasting radio station, broadcasting since 1965, and it's 53rd year on the air, third oldest broadcasting station in the United States. Appreciate you being with us. I'm Steve Reinhart. I'm signing off. I'll be back next weekend, Saturday, 3 o'clock p.m. Please stay tuned.